Hey, good evening. Welcome to College Side Tonight. We are excited that you are joining us for our online Wednesday night Bible study. You know, there are some moments where the weather doesn't completely cooperate, and today when we were filming, John's lesson was one of those moments. So as you're watching, you're going to notice the light kind of go up and go down. That was just a storm rolling through, and we lost all the light in the room. So we did our best to give you the best experience that we could give you. But I'll tell you this, even though the weather was coming through and uh, things changed with our video, the message stayed the same. The message was fantastic. So I hope you enjoy another lesson from our series on anchors. I hope you're taking advantage of all the different opportunities we have online for you to be a part of what's going on uh, through our app, through the emails we send, through our new website. I just hope you're taking advantage of everything you can take advantage of. Uh, I pray that this time has been a blessing to you. I'm excited about what's ahead as we start to plan and work toward getting back together again. And I'm sure we'll have some, uh, some things to share about that soon. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, we pray that you're blessed with this lesson of our series on anchors. Thanks again. Hey, welcome back. It's good that, uh, that we're back together. I'm grateful that you've chosen to be with us uh, in our midweek Bible study here at College Side. I'm thankful for every time that we have the opportunity to study uh, from God's Word. and I'm, I'm grateful for tonight. Um, I hope that you are doing well, uh, and I I'm excited to see what God has got to say to us. Regardless of how we are feeling tonight, and we probably have got feelings all across the spectrum going on in the world today and, and maybe even in uh, folks that are joining with us tonight. Here, here's what I know, regardless of how you feel, God's got something to say uh, to us every night, but, but he's got something to say to us tonight. So let's bow and ask God to bless our time and then we'll jump in and we'll study together. Let's pray. God, I'm grateful for uh, the chance that we have tonight to study from your word as always, I am thankful for your word. I'm grateful to be able um, to be in the word with people all across the place. Um, God, I pray that you would speak to us tonight. We, we confess that we need you to speak to us. Um, we need truth. We need the reality that is objective that we can bank on that comes from your word and really only from your word. So, Father, I pray that I would get out of the way and that you would speak to us all tonight. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, uh, our King and our Savior and our Lord. Uh, amen. Times like we live in certainly cause us to ask questions, and we've been asking a lot of questions over the last several weeks in this study that, that, that I've called Anchors. And my hope has been from the very beginning that we would see that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that throughout Scripture, that every type of literature we find in the Bible offers the opportunity for us to anchor to a reality, to anchor to a truth that will help us avoid some of the fear and the panic uh, that we as human beings can fall into pretty easily. We're susceptible to fear, and I think the Lord knows that. Um, and so I think the Bible is filled with texts that help us know what's true, what's real, what we can bank on, what doesn't change. There are promises that God makes that exist. They just are, regardless of what we face and experience. And so while we have a lot of questions today, maybe you have started asking some questions for the future. Let's see if this, see if this sounds familiar. What is it going to look like? When all this is over, and it's going to be over, one way or another, it's going to be over. This time is going to pass. What is it going to look like? What, what's church going to look like? What's, what's going to the grocery store 
going to look like? What does the assembly on Sundays look like? What does it look like to go to family reunions? What does it look like? And by it, I mean what does life look like? And you're probably asking that question, and if you haven't been asking it, you're certainly going to ask it at some point in the future. What is it going to look like when all this is over, when things, quote, get back to normal? What is the new normal? That's a phrase that we've heard a lot recently. So while we have present questions, we also have future questions. Now, this is why it's so important to base what we feel on what we know rather than the other way around. I saw a national uh, news a segment this morning interviewing different first-year freshman college students uh, in the Northeast about how they would feel if class started back. Well, of course, the feelings were all over the place. Some said this and others said this because feelings are so subjective. And while God doesn't want us to rob ourselves of feelings. In fact, he empowers those feelings. He does want us to base those feelings on what we can know. For me, and this is just for me, and maybe this will uh, give you a window into some of my own weirdness, I don't know, but for me over the last seven weeks, the part of the Bible that I have been the most drawn to is the prophetic literature. We talked about Jeremiah a couple of weeks ago, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, minor prophets, all the prophets that exist in the Old Testament. I have found myself just really, really, really encouraged and fed and watered by reading those passages. And part of that's because of some academic pursuit, but, but that was just the entry point into why I was in the prophets. For me, the prophets have been a wellspring of life. And, and I sat down, and I, I really, I asked myself the question, why have the prophets been such a rewarding read for me lately? I asked myself that question a couple of days ago. And, and here's why. I, I wrote down three as I spent just some personal time with the Lord, why the prophets have seemed so relevant to me recently. And, and, and there's three. Trouble comes, but God is always present. Trouble comes, but God is always present. And every prophet speaks that truth. Now, they speak it in different ways. They demonstrate that truth using different um, demonstrations. Trouble comes, but God is always present. And, and here's the reality. It doesn't matter what generation we're a part of, what, where we live, what time uh, in history we find ourselves. It's always true. Trouble comes. Trouble always comes, but God is always present. And every prophet speaks that truth. So that's the first one. The second one for me is trouble will end. And God is always faithful. Trouble is not going to last forever. Um, it may seem like it in the moment. And even when trouble is bad, right? Like when, when the exile was the worst that it could have been for Old Testament, Old Covenant folks, it might have felt like trouble's never going to be over. This is always going to last. I'm going to live in this forever. And some people might have lived out their days in exile, but the period of time ended. And this period of time is going to end too. So the prophets say trouble comes, but God's always present. But trouble is going to end because God's always faithful to his promise and to his word. And every prophet speaks that message. And then maybe the third that has been the most rewarding for me personally is, and this is a little metaphorical, there's always a sunrise after a dark night. There's always hope for redemption. There's always hope for a remnant of God's people to come back to the promised land. And nearly every prophet speaks of that hope that will come. Even though you are in the dark night, 
sun's going to come up. This period's going to end. And hope is coming. Hope exists now. Even though you might find it difficult to feel. And every prophet speaks this message. Which is what makes Isaiah chapter 40 so interesting to me. Now, I didn't plan on talking about Isaiah 40 until just a couple of days ago um, when I was reading a passage that if you've spent any amount of time in God's Word, there's no doubt you've heard. Or if you've watched movies, uh, there's no doubt that you've heard. At the end of Isaiah 40 is... Uh, even you, yous grow tired and weary, but those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up on eagles' wings. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but that whole chapter that leads us to that verse has got something to say against the backdrop of the prophets that is really, really, really extraordinary. The prophets want to get to how you feel through what you know, not the other way around. And Isaiah 40 is interesting against that backdrop. In the 40th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah transports to the future in a way. Now, Isaiah is a little different from other prophetic works in that Isaiah is what we call classical prophecy. A lot of the book, very much of the book, is straight up, this is going to happen in the future. Now, there was a, a, a reality that existed in the time that Isaiah spoke it, but much of Isaiah is Isaiah the prophet saying, on behalf of God, this is the word of the Lord, this is going to come in the future. Exile's coming. Primarily, Isaiah stayed in the southern part uh, where Jerusalem was centered, and he would interact with the kings that lived in Jerusalem, and he told them, Babylon's going to come in, and Babylon's going to take away everything. And a lot of the folks that lived in Jerusalem during the time of Isaiah didn't believe him. They thought he was a crazy person. Like, picture Isaiah as the guy on the street corner with a sign that says, the end is coming. When you pass those folks, you don't believe what they got to say. The difference between those folks and Isaiah is Isaiah had a direct connection with God himself. And God, through Isaiah, was saying, exile's coming. Babylon is coming. And they're going to take everything. They're, they're going to take everything. And chapters 1 through 39 of the book of Isaiah basically, in one way or another, share that message. Exile is coming. You have not followed the word of the Lord, Jerusalem and Judah and Israel. Therefore, Babylon's going to come and they're going to take you into exile. And then there's a shift in the 40th chapter. And Isaiah is still living in the moment that he was living in but he transports to the future and he starts talking to folks that would be living in Babylon years, decades from when he gave the word because he knew, God knew, that they would start asking questions about the future. What does worship look like if we don't have access to the temple? Now, I don't want to meddle, but that sounds, uh, that sounds pretty familiar to us, doesn't it? If God is so good, so these are folks that are reading decades from when Isaiah gave the word of the Lord, living in Babylon in the middle of exile. Jerusalem has been sacked and is left in ruins. And these folks are asking, what does worship look like? like, like how, what does life look like? Look like If God does love us, if we've read these 39 chapters before in Isaiah and God does love us, what does life look like? How, how do we define what it means to be a follower of God when we don't know what's what? When we want to hope that we can return home, 
But we're still living in Babylon and we're reading the words of a man who gave these words decades before the exile even happened. And while the questions are not explicit, they are certainly implicit throughout the last part of the entire book of Isaiah. Most people probably thought Isaiah had lost it a little bit in the moment. But when the exiles in Babylon start reading these words and hearing these prophecies, these questions start to well up in their heart. <laughs> Prophets are incredible. Start with me in the first verse of Isaiah chapter 40. L look at how he opens this section of the text written to future exiles in Babylon. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the deserts a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill shall be made low. You see the first word in that text? Isaiah 40 and verse 1. Comfort. Now that doesn't just happen. <laughs> Comfort. What's his message? The sun is going to rise. God, who exiled your forefathers because of their disobedience and is now speaking to you in the midst of exile, is saying, you're going to come home and you have questions. What does it look like? I don't understand what's real. I don't know if I can trust this. And the first word from God is comfort. That's no small detail. Comfort. Warfare is ended. Iniquity is pardoned. I want you to hear the prophetic message. Comfort. <laughs> Comfort. Comfort. Even in exile, even when the world has changed, even when you've got all of these present questions and these future questions. Comfort. What tender word is God speaking to you right now? That's what he says in the second verse. Comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. What tender word do you need? Here's what I want you to know. If you need it, I mean, if you deep down in your bone, if you need it, if it is a need, I'm not talking about want, I'm not talking about desire, I'm talking about need. If it's a need that you have, I promise you, God is tenderly giving you a word for that need. That's what he does. I thought a lot about this idea of comfort and tender words from the Lord. And I think there's a couple of ways that we can go in the time in which we live today. And I want, I want you to follow me here. The temptation exists for a lot of people to just live in panic and fear. Um, based on just kind of getting blown around and not knowing what's what, what's true, what's trustworthy. You just, you just kind of live in fear, and, and, and it's easy to kind of unplug from God and to just kind of exist and to be pushed around by the world. That's a temptation that I think we can agree we ought to avoid. But let me tell you another temptation that a lot of believers can get sucked into. This is a temptation that says, okay, let me clench my fist, and from my own strength, let me attack something right? Let me go after it and go get it. Let me charge at something. 
And we can be wooed into believing that that is a proper response to the present and future questions that we have. And hear me when I say that attacking and charging is certainly a part of God's desire for us in this moment, but not first. The first word the prophet wanted them to hear was comfort. Which means that the prophet Isaiah and ultimately God himself is giving space for the people to feel. <laughs> like he's not coming to him and saying, hey, you shouldn't feel that way. No, he's saying, I'm going to comfort you in how you feel. Based on what you can know about me, I'm going to touch how you feel feel. Maybe you do attack, but you don't attack first. And I want you to know that if what you're going through right now is related to the coronavirus, if what you're going through right now is related to grief because you've lost a loved one, and in this season grief begets grief because we can't even grieve like we want to, or if you're grieving something else, or if you're stressed out economically, I want you to know that how you feel right where you're at, the challenges that you face today, God's first word isn't to give you some systematic strategy for in your own might and in your own strength to figure out how do you go do something. God's first word is comfort. Maybe that's the word you need tonight. Here's what I know. One tender word from the Lord is better than any of our strength. One tender word, sincere, loving, grace-filled word, one word, one word is better than all of our strength that we can possibly muster to make ourselves feel like we are in control. And I believe with all of my heart that God has a word for your situation. Whatever it is, whatever your situation is, God's got a word. And it's tender. And it's comfort. Breathe that in. Think about your circumstance, right? Yeah. Think about how you feel for sure. What does that tender word sound like? What's he saying? In the midst of your doubt and sickness and stress, what, what is his comforting word? It's not, go do something. Mm -mm. Not first, not first. Soak it in. People who would read these words from Isaiah would know that though they are in Babylon, God is speaking comfort to them. Knowing that Isaiah wrote these words before the exile even began even further indicates God's desire to give them comfort. Track with me here on into the, on into the chapter. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the, one, of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This, this text is going to show up in our text uh, during our Sunday assembly. Peter uses Isaiah chapter 40. We'll, we'll get to that on Sunday. Circumstances end, Isaiah says. Grass withers away, the flowers fade, God's word lasts forever. Circumstances end, right? Trouble comes, trouble ends, and the sun is going to rise. What you are feeling right now has a shelf life. It has a shelf life. One way or another, it will in. That's why what you know is so important. From Babylon, Babylon's going to end. 
The exile is going to end. Coming to Jerusalem, that's going to end. Everything ends based how you feel on what you know. And this is, this is incredibly fascinating to me because what Isaiah says you can know is the word of the Lord. What is the word of the Lord? Comfort. In this context, in this passage, the word from the Lord is a tender word of comfort. And it lasts forever. Listen, Babylon ain't got nothing on the comfort of the Lord. Babylon ain't got nothing. The coronavirus, this time, the grief, the stress, the doubt, the, the weirdness. What's it going to be? What's it going to look like? What's, it's going to end. God's comfort lasts forever. Let's read one more chunk of this together before we close. Pick it up with me in the 27th verse. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Listen, it may seem in days like today that God has lost a step. Circumstances are such where it may appear like somehow God has lost control or lost something. The enemy wants to use circumstances to increase fear about what will come. You see, as we go through periods of time, not only do we have present questions, we have future questions that then allow us to project fear out into the future and to project grief out into the future that our enemy wants to use to change how we feel about God today. Why do you say, oh, Jacob, where is God? Does he not know where I'm at? Isaiah says, don't ask. Because God knows. Walking back from Babylon to Jerusalem, which is probably the way most people felt like that trip was going to happen. Even if it did happen, it was going to be long and arduous and difficult and dangerous. God's not only going to strengthen them in Babylon and promise them a future reality in Jerusalem, but God is going to fly them on eagle's wings back home, which in its original context is the power of what God is saying. Not only is he saying, I'm going to promise you a future reality, I'm actually going to help you get there and give you whatever strength you need to get to where I want you to go. That's why I say that one of the temptations that we can fall into is to just white-knuckle everything and say, in my own power, I'm going to go do something. God says even young people get tired. Even strong people get weak. But if you wait on me, if you trust in me, if you have faith that I will deliver on the promises I've made, I'm going to fly you wherever I've promised you will go. God is honest with what we face. And He wants us to be honest about what we face. But our strength is not what gets it done. His strength. His strength. Not our planning, not our tactics, not our schemes. His his word lasts forever. And the word I want you to hear that lasts forever tonight is tender comfort. 
it's okay for you to feel the way you feel. But I want you to know it's not okay to stay there because I want you to take your feelings and root them in what we can know. God is faithful. God never lies. God is able. And God is power. And nothing we face makes those promises any less true today than they've ever been in the history of the world. L let me leave you with a couple of things that maybe somebody needs to hear tonight. Be patient with yourself. Again, the, the, the temptation is such that we either just completely disconnect and fall away and say, I'm not going to do that, or we feel like we got to go accomplish something, and if we don't accomplish something, then somehow we're not being faithful in this moment. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with how you feel. Ask for comfort. Like, like seriously, when we're done tonight, say, God, I need comfort. I need your tender word. Would you speak it to me and believe that he will? He will. He's got a word of comfort for you right where you're at, regardless of what you face tonight. Ask him. Don't feel like you've got to be strong all the time. The reason the prophet gives them comfort and says, I'm going to speak to you comforts because they weren't strong all the time. Be patient with yourself. While you ask for comfort, this is the second thing, while you ask for comfort, trust God. Trust that He will deliver on all the promises that He has made. If He is God and He is, then be honest with His ability to help you with whatever you face. How do you need God's help right now. Ask Him. Pour that out. Take that to the cross of Jesus Christ and say, God, this is what I need. I need comfort. And He'll give it to you. Trust Him. And here's the third thing. Don't live in discouragement. The sun's going to rise. We don't know what it looks like, but it's going to be beautiful. Because God's painting a picture. Don't be discouraged. Ask God for what you need. And whatever it looks like, here's what I can promise you. We'll do it together. We'll do it together. You'll be surrounded by people who will be doing the same thing that you will be doing. You won't be alone. You're never alone. Don't be discouraged. Hope always follows trouble, and hope lasts forever. The word of the Lord endures forever. Grass fades, flower fades. The word of comfort, tender compassion from God lasts forever. He's going to give it. My prayer for us tonight is that we would know, we would know that God cares about how we feel, and that God's words of comfort are far better than anything we can do. Trust Him. Ask Him. He will deliver. Let's pray together. God, I'm grateful for the time that we've been able to share in this passage. I'm thankful for Isaiah. I'm thankful for the prophets. I'm thankful for these lessons. Trouble comes, trouble ends, and the sun always rises. Help us know it. We need it. Father, we pray that you would bless our circumstances. We pray that you would help us in the way we feel because you help us know. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed this week.